We're continuing in the uh, tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah. The surah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had mentioned that whichever home it is recited in, the devil will be uh, averted or removed by said reading. And for sure what that means is that whoever would read often this scripture and understand the meanings in Baqarah because it is the most comprehensive, longest, detailed surah, And what it does is it goes through an anthology of looking back into the historical realities of the Israelites, the people who were um, blessed and favored among all nations in the history of mankind with the message, with prophethood, with scriptures, with divine support, with food and all the things that they need. Assalamu alaikum, mashallah. Who's creeping up on me there? Alhamdulillah. So now uh, we're going to go into whenever we said last week, he said, O Israelite, O children of Israel, remember my favors upon you and that I preferred you over all the nations of the earth. And be cautious and protect yourself from a day that no one can benefit anyone else. No one, no group of people with power and wealth can ransom themselves their souls on that day. A day that the only thing that has any value is your connection to divine monotheism and the truth of spirituality and the intentions and actions you do that reflect it. That's all that will help anyone. And we are all in the kullu nafsim bima kasabat rahina. Every individual is responsible for their own selves. وَأَن لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى هُوَ And the human being will not have except for what he or she has done for their own best interest. So blessings are big tests. Um, it blew my mind. When I lived in Egypt, I remember I used to go to the mosque every day, obviously. So you basically walk outside the door and there's a mosque. <laughs> so they said the... Yani, Asha, Alf, Madana, or something like that. You can't, you, you don't have to search to find it. And any time the government would allow a mosque to do a lesson, some sheikh would go there and give a lesson, packed. People would go there, everybody would come. And I was, mashallah, happy to be there. Even whenever I really didn't have strong roots in the language, but in the last few months of me being there, I, alhamdulillah, was able to obtain, you know, the language, and uh, then it became a whole new big blessing. So then I moved to Kuwait. And I would go to big, beautiful mosques, much bigger and much more beautiful. The, the rugs are like, you're walking on clouds. It's like there's like three layers of padding under there. And if it's during the hot day, there's like full blast air conditioning all over the place. You just feel so comfortable. You go in there, it's like so beautiful. All of the calligraphy and everything. And then the sheikh comes in, mashallah, and they have the lesson, and there's like 20 people. Now, they have less mosques, so there's more people living close to that mosque where the lesson is, but people aren't coming. Same thing for the daily prayers. The amount of people who are attending the daily prayers, actually you'll see, percentage-wise, who most of the people at the daily prayers are. Who are they? The servants, the Bangladeshi and the Indian and the servants, the Egyptian brothers that work as the Bawab and all of this. They're all doing, they're coming every day for every salah. What is the difference between the two? One knows that what I have and that all that matters is I have Allah. The other one thinks that they have so much wealth and wastagna. He thought he was sufficient. So this is the test. Many people don't realize bala. One of the biggest bala is having wealth and comfort in your life. وَإِذْ نَجَّيْنَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ This is the ayah right here. 
Remember when we saved you from Pharaoh's people as they afflicted you with great suffering, killing your male children, sparing your women, and that was a great test. So God is now bringing to light probably perhaps the biggest Israelite opening or conquest because they had all become as a nation the slave servants of the Pharaoh, Pharaoh dynasty of Egypt. Thousands and thousands of the Israelites, the Jews were all slaves. So what happened was the soothsayers of the Pharaoh's court came to Pharaoh and said, we fear that there will come a great man from these people. He will grow up and become a great king and ruler and leader. So Pharaoh said, all kids must be killed if they are male. And we need to keep the females for ourselves. And many scholars said because of the idea of mixing the uh, progeny. Because the, the, the prophecy is a Jew. Jews have this idea of purity. And it comes from where? The mother. So they want to mix it all up and then get things confused and all of this. So that's what some scholars said. Some scholars said that they would keep them just as slaves and you let the women do all the work. So, وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ Surah Al-A'raf بَلَوْنَاهُمْ Tested بَلَا often means calamity. People think it's calamity, hardship. What does Allah say is the first biggest calamity? When there's a principle of Islamic legal theory that when something was men mentioned first, that carries meaning. Like in context in the Quran, you'll see mostly, he said, Inna Rabbaka Ghafurur Rahim, wa Inna Hula Shadid Al Iqab. But in a couple of exceptions, contextually, he's emphasizing Shadid Al Iqab before his mercy and forgiveness. And you will see why. So the Quran is nothing is haphazard. This is divine perfection of presenting guidance. That's why you can keep reading it and reading it and reading it and you'll read this tafsir and that tafsir and the other tafsir and you'll be thinking and pondering over it and you will come to see new things about guidance and that will happen until the day of judgment. If it's 10,000 years, 100,000 years from now, people will continue to write new tafsirs and have new commentaries and see new beautiful truths from it. Anybody who studied the Quran knows this. So, it is that they were tested with goodness People are tested with goodness and badness so that they would return. So when we're blessed with a good thing, um, I remember my, one of my mashayikh back in, one of my teachers in, in uh, Dearborn, Sheikh Mustafa Tolba, he would do lots of sujood shukr. Some, something would happen that was, he really liked, it, he would just go prostrate. I said, what are you coming? Salah, what is that? He was like, no, I'm just going to, I just want Allah know, I'm very thankful for all He's done for me. Things keep happening in my favor, alhamdulillah. This is a good thing to do. One of the best things to do. I imagine, now, ishtiraku niyyah, to combine an intention, there's a difference of opinion among scholars, but what I'm convinced with, if your primary thing is I'm doing what pleases God because I want to get close to Him and that is my purpose. But at the same time, I would like people to see So if I'm out praying or making a prostration in public, I would hope that somebody would notice and they would ask me. Because guess that what that will do? That will shine the light. So you know, I'm very grateful that God has blessed me so much, so I'm just prostrating to Him in, in gratitude. I've never seen this before. These people are amazing. These people are super spiritual. That's how any normal person would think about this, right? Mm -hmm. And this is not like we're showing off because it's following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He told us to do this. The great miracle. 
وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ Remember when we split the sea, saving you from Pharaoh and his army. Then we drowned them all as you look back. So God led them to the Red Sea, the story is. And some scholars try to say it was some different river or something like that. But the majority said it's the actual Red Sea, which is a big place. And then they stopped in front of it, they saw Pharaoh's army coming. Now, the level of faith in the Israelites still weak. It shouldn't be, because they've just witnessed huge signs. And let's just go back for a second. It's not just a matter of a staff. We're talking about the sky, you know, raining down with the locusts and the blood and, the, and the, all that stuff. Some amazing things have happened. So they turned to him, what is going to happen? He said, my Lord is with me, don't worry. So then God said, hit your staff. Now, does the staff have magical powers? It does not have magical powers. Does the staff have anything to do with the parting of the sea? Nothing. Allah is teaching you, if you want miracles to happen, obey Him. Just do it without question. That does not negate after obeying and doing that as a policy because you've come to ratify the miraculous revelation and where it came from, that you'll ask about it. Why? Because the Quran tells us. It's the directive comes up many times in the Quran. They ask about this, they ask about that. This is a revelation for those with insight, with deep thought, with pondering and contemplating. All of that. So, this is uh, the reality just when you know that God tells you to do it, don't think, I'm going to do it conditionally upon my mind understanding it, because now you're putting your mind before the directive of the one that allows the synapses and electrical impulses in your mind to work in the first place. It is His law that your brain is functioning, that you can see, hear, smell, talk, and all that. That's God's law. Your body is in submission to His will. So for you to decide with your conscious thought process, well, hold on now. Before I do this, you know, so I, I'll never forget, I went through this thing. It's a, it seems trivial, but it's just a story, you know, that, you know, um, whenever I was a new Muslim, I remember the brother, he told me, he said, when you're going to make your tashahud, you need to flick your finger like this. Here's the hadith. Okay. And then, some other brother tells me that what he means is, this is tahrik. So you put it out there and you keep it like that. That's it. And then I saw one brother, he was doing it in a circle. I didn't know what was going on with this finger thing. And I kept bouncing between these things because I don't know. This brother saying that, brother said, what, is, what are we doing here? Then I went to go study with Sheikh Adnan in Kuwait. He said, Ishara Tawheed. Ishara Tawheed. That's a, it's the indication of the oneness of God. Right? Atahiyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibah wa salam alayka in Nabi Rahmatullahi. Every time the Prophet is going, when he says God. You know, it looks like that. You know? Now it made sense. But should I have waited to follow this until I understood that for me? No, I should just do whatever I found in the hadith and keep learning. That's how, we, that's how we should all do. Keep Do what God has asked you to do and then maybe He will bless you with the knowledge and maybe not. And for sure there were things put there that, you know, so one brother said, I know there's authentic hadith in Bukhari and Muslim said the Prophet was raising his hand. Sami Allah alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. He was doing that. But, I don't know, I, don't know I, I was told not to do that, so I don't do it. I said, okay, but the Prophet ﷺ did it. No, it's one of the hadith, Bukhari, Muslim man, there's no question about that. He was like, eh, I don't know. Just do it, then later maybe you'll find out. Maybe you won't. We were not meant to be perfect. We were not meant to be all-knowing. So, that was before, you know, the, so once they go over, now they're getting close to Palestine, and that's a long story, you know. We get to Ashura. So, I don't want to confuse anybody. This becomes confusing. I'll try to sum it up very easily for you. 
So, actually, we have hadith that says that Quraysh used to do Ashura in Mecca. This is an authentic hadith. So that throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing. And then, you have the Prophet ﷺ coming to Medina, and when he first was there and he saw the Jews, they were fasting on that day. He asked them why. They said, we're celebrating the day we were saved, this, this, hadith, this ayah right here. So the Prophet ﷺ said, we are right, more rightful to Moses than you. We love him more than you, we follow him more than you, so we will do this. Can you imagine that that's not true? That the Prophet ﷺ will follow something falsely? Or could it be that perhaps the Prophet ﷺ is saying, if you all agree that that is there, then we agree with that? There's deep implications to this hadith when it comes to appreciating things that we hold in similarity between us and non-Muslims. If you think about this hadith deeply, Sheikh Ahmed al-Kurdi, Khabir uh, al-Mosu'a al fiqhi al Kuwaitiya, famous Hanafi scholar from Halab, uh, Syria, and he's on the fiqh council of Kuwait. He's the, uh, over, he's the overseer of the encyclopedia, the 45 volume encyclopedia of Islamic law. Um, I was asking him about Valentine's Day one time. He brought this hadith. He said, as uh, far as I know, I read about it that there was some guy named St. Valentine. He was like a Catholic priest. And the king has prohibited marriage between young men because... He wants men to be willing to fight and go die valiantly for the Roman Empire. He knew if they get married, they want to come back home to my wife and kids. So they're not going to fight so bravely. They will easily retreat. So he prohibited marriage. St. Valentine said marriage is a divine institution. We will establish this marriage. So that's, that's the foundations, according to many historians, of this Catholic practice of Valentine's Day to appreciate the institution of marriage now do we uh, Muslims and Catholics agree that institution of marriage husband and wife it's there as the nucleus of society it's supposed to be sacred we should promote it do we agree on this do we agree on this it's something very it's from the divine revelation since day one Adam and Eve it all starts there okay so Sheikh was saying if you as a as a Muslim are going along with Valentine's Day saying نحن أولى باحترام عقد الزواج واحترام نظام الزواج منهم then you have the hadith here as a qiyas he said if you are saying I support Valentine's Day because we promote marriage and marriage is a sacred institution and my husband, my wife and I'm their husband and we have this kind of a uh, special remembrance of this special thing because of this day. He said, there's an analogy here what the Prophet did uh, with this one. The first time I ever heard that. Allahu Akbar. Now here's where the, the problem comes in. If you're to study Jewish literature, you'll find um, not the Jews of Yemen, not the Jews of Morocco, not the Jews of Iraq, not the small Jews, group of Jews in Egypt. None of them are celebrating something called Ashura. There is no Jew on the face of earth that I can find, and I have spent hours and I've talked to many rabbis, and I've looked up on the websites of Arab Jewish communities, which exist. They, they are Arabs who speak Arabic for generations, and they are Jews, Orthodox. Hat, everything, curls, strings coming out of the thing. And they don't have, they're not celebrating Ashura. But, if you study Yom Kippur, it falls on the 10th day of that Hebrew calendar. Let me ask you a question. Do Jews have a Hebrew calendar? They do. They have had a Hebrew calendar since their history. They've always been following it. Very strict about this. Their identity. It's who they are. They're Hebrews. That's, the, that's their culture. As Arabs are Arabs, the Jews are Hebrews. And uh, they have their own 12 months on there. And they mark all of their holidays on that calendar. And it is different than all other calendars. And it's on the year 6,000 something or other. Their calendar. It's a 6,000 something or other. They've been counting this one. 
Can you imagine that Jews were following a religious practice on the 10th day of, of Muharram? An Arabic calendar? Knowing how they acted towards their Arabic counterparts? And what we learned from the seerah. I'm just throwing a monkey wrench on the whole 9th or the 11th deal here. I don't have any problem with Ashura because this is mentioned by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But this idea that we should fast the 9th or the 11th has no value to me. And here's where the game gets plot thickens. The Prophet ﷺ met them when he first came to Medina. Ibn Abbas comes to him nine years later, eight years later. And he says, well, um, you have mentioned that sometimes that we should not imitate Ahl al-Kitab. But we know for eight years he has been, and the Muslims have been. He said, if I live, I will fast the ninth. Why? To be different from Ahl al-Kitab. So we know the Prophet ﷺ his whole life because he died. He did not live to do that. The Prophet ﷺ never fasted the ninth or the eleventh. This is a, a interpretation of what we should do if indeed we're. So now, why? Because to stand out as we're not doing just like the Jews, we appreciate this, the Prophet told us, but here's how we're going to separate ourselves. Now that there's. Uh, and I'll give you a hundred dollars. Because I've done so much research, I'll give anybody one hundred dollars if you can find me a Jew who fasts Ashura on planet Earth. I'm that, comf I'm, I'm that comfortable with, with this thing. Why are we trying to be different from them if they don't do it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I hate to just like completely... <laughs> but this is what happens when you start studying stuff. It goes a little bit deeper than just the basic hadith. Okay. Moses to Mount Sinai. وَإِذْ وَعَدْنَا مُوسَى أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Remember when Moses was called uh, for 40 nights. Then in his absence, he worshipped the calf in transgression. So God said, come to the Mount Sinai. Tur, Jabal Tur. I'm going to give you the commandments. The word Moses, actually Moshe'ah, is the Hebrew word for Moses is Moshe'a. It means the one taken out or the ones draw it out, draw it out. It's interesting that the actual word in Hebrew refers to what he did with the people from Egypt. You know Yeshua, what it means? Jesus, the Savior. It's interesting, you know. Historically, words have meanings. So... So, there is some scholar said like this. You're right. Imam al Qurtubi said this. Taken out, taken out from the river. Mm -hmm. That's another one. Yeah. So taken out or so the one yeah, like here taken out of the river. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. they. So, uh, is, is exactly. So you have all these different opinions about what is this, but it's interesting. Taken out because even if that's what that means, he was taken out of the river. So how, how that's his name. Is what he, the significant thing that happened to him is his name. Allahu Akbar. Now we have Bob, Billy, Sarah, Julie. What does that mean? <laughs> so my son's name is Justice. The Prophet said, Ahsinu asma'akum fa innakum tuda'una biha yawm al-qiyamah. Pick good names. You'll be called upon it on the Day of Judgment. Isn't that right? Well, the ask Baba. Shoot Baba. See what he says. So, uh, 30 nights, God added 10. Now, some scholars say this was Dhul Qa'da. If you look in the tafsir, they're going to say it's Dhul Qa'da and Dhul Hijjah. Once again, I'm having a hard time with this tafsir because Jews do not use the Arabic calendar, particularly in Moses' time in... <laughs> I don't know where they're getting this from. Well, I do know where they're getting it from. They're making an assessment. Somebody said, and they're passing it along in the tafsir. You have to understand. Tafsir is a science of possibilities to explain the ayah. It is not hadith sciences. You will find all kinds of human opinions in the tafsir. And you should look into all of those and see what makes sense out of it linguistically. And see if there's some athar or some ahadith that are 
reasonably acceptable and things like that to, you know, to understand it. But you will find all kind of stuff in there. It doesn't mean, you know, like have you ever heard of Qisat al-Gharaniq? The story of Surat al-Najm. The story of uh, Satan's verses, satanic verses. You ever heard about that one? The story that the Prophet ﷺ is reading Surah Al-Najm. This is found in Ibn Kathir's tafsir. He puts it in there like it is. Exactly as I say, Ibn Kathir put it in the tafsir. Other Imams put it in the tafsir. Said, Prophet ﷺ reading Surah Al-Najm. And he says, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى تِلْكَ الْغَرَنِيقَ الْعُولَى وَإِنَّ شَفَاعَتُهُمْ لَتُرْجَى that supposedly the Prophet ﷺ told everybody to praise Manat and Lat and Uzza um, and that Daya will intercede for you and all of that. And then everybody prostrated. All of the Mecca did this. And then they bring in the tafsir of Surah Al-Hajj. وَيُلْقِ الشَّيَاطِينَ عَلَىٰ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ That the Prophets came and sometimes the devil threw things in there. That hadith is da'if jiddan according to hadith sciences. It has major weaknesses in it. But they throw it in there. They don't put it in the Ibn Kathir. You know, he does not the same thing. He's not a muhaddith. So I'm just helping you to understand that if you're reading a book of tafsir, not everything in there is golden. It's just like the whole story that before Adam and Eve, there were jinns. And there was a battle for jinns. And they shed blood. And the angels came down and wrestled them down and put them in the ocean. You heard about this? Yes. Absolutely no authenticity to this at all. There's no basis for this. Some story somebody told and put in the tafsir and all the mushayikh and the khutaba have been spitting and all. I mean, I've heard it from mushayikh overseas. So that's where we have to be careful. So Samiri, he's a Jewish guy. He was watching, the story is, he was watching the angel Gabriel came with the, was that, Burak? He was like, Moses, hop on. I'm going to take you to the mountain. It's the express. And then there was the spot where his hoof was. So he goes over there and he takes that dirt. It's holy dirt. It's the old eastern mentality. Right? Old school, way back Noah, you know, worshipping the idol. Oh, this is holy dirt. And then the, the miracle just happened. And now we have the gold from the Pharaoh. So we'll take the gold. And then we'll put the dirt in there. And then we'll become a holy calf. And then they made sure that they put a stick in the, from the mouth to the rear, so there's a hole. So when the wind blew, and they, they were believing this is a holy calf, it's mooing. Samiri had him. So everybody started worshipping the calf. Not everybody. Some of the stories said, that's where Judaism comes from. Some people said, but those from the tribe of Judah did not. You see? Because there's 12 tribes of the Israelites. Judah is the third son that they said is the best. And here's where they stood out. They said, we're not, this is not correct. This is not our forefather, Yaqub. Jacob did not teach us this way. We don't do like this. Shirk is evil and all that. Well, there's, once again, we don't have any authenticity on that. That's what they said. So... Whenever he said, you know, min ba'di. In the Quran it says, ثُمَّ اتَّخَلْتُمُ الْعِجَلَ مِن بَعْدِهِ مِن بَعْدِ ذِهَابِ مُوسَى That's the meaning of it. See, this is called ijaz. In Arabic, there's ijaz and itnab. Ijaz means to smash up meanings in clear, poetic style so that you can get a lot of meaning out of a small statement. Itnab, there's a point that really needs to be emphasized, which in some surahs Allah keeps repeating something. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right? Again. This is Itnab. He's re... Some of the surahs, Inna fi thalika la ayata li qawmi. Right? Or, Wa ma kana aktharuhum mu'mineen. Right? This comes up in surah Shu'ara a lot. Many times. Over after every story. This is Itnab. He's making the point, hammering it down. So you won't forget about it. This is also the secret of why the same stories get said. I read this whole article of a 
on an Arabic website called La Diniyun or something like that. No religion people. You guys said, I don't believe in the Quran. It's just, they got, they clearly uh, wanted to make their book seem bigger. And so they said the same story many times to make it seem bigger. Allahu Akbar. If you read these stories and the, the subtle differences and in the context of the surah and what it's all adding up to with the rest of the stories and the blow your mind uh, literarily but yet the someone who's looking for kufr will get their kufr وَمَن يُضْلِ yeah, he, he will open that door if that's what they're looking for if you're looking for guidance it will never be ending of the beauty Okay, ثُمَّ عَفَوْنَا عَنْكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُونَ Even after that, you worshipped a golden calf after all these miracles that God gave us and we know historically to worship only God, I still, we still forgive you that. We pardon you. This is the royal we. Majestic plural. When he says, we did that, it's like some significant event that carries big Im uh, impact and meaning. Implications. So that you could give thanks. He forgives you so you could be grateful. So like, that's why when somebody says, Allahu Ghafoorur Rahim, they don't pray, drink, you know like, one time my wife found sister on the Facebook bragging about how she took, her friends took her out for some beers. Sister, she sees Muslim and all that. So my wife's trying to talk to her. Sister, what? How is every? How is everything? Are you? You know? Did you? Are you not feeling comfortable with Islam anymore? What's going on? She said, "Oh, I'm a Muslim. Alhamdulillah." She was like, "But you're putting on Facebook that you're drinking beers with your friends." She said, "Allah is merciful and forgiving. Don't you know this?" She's like, "Everybody has shortcomings. Well, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's not like I was getting drunk and doing crazy things." So if he's if imagine. You've done some sins. And then you seek His forgiveness. This doesn't mean now I can go back to my sins and I'm forgiven now. Let's go party. What it is is like, Alhamdulillah, let's go pray some exercise. Inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat. Good deeds will remove the bad deeds, the Quran is telling us. That doesn't mean you don't seek forgiveness. It means after you've sought forgiveness, now you feel incentive. I want to go do, I want to show my gratitude because I know He's forgiving me. I want to be careful about my soul. With Atina Musa al Kitab wal Furqana la tahtadun. Remember when we gave Moses the scripture and the criterion so that you may be guided. So who is God talking to? La tahtadun. It's in the Quran. Allah in the Quran is saying La so that you could be guided. Who's he talking to? He's literally talking to the Israelite people in the Quran. This is khitab mubashir, a direct discussion with Jewish people. This Quran is not a book for Arabs or Muslims. It's a book lil alameen. So he's reminding them, the biggest favor of all, I gave you the scripture. Go back to it. So the furqan is what you get when you understand the scripture. Some people think the furqan is the scripture itself. And that's why even some scholars, they try to refer to the Qur'an as the Furqan. No, it is the means of having the Furqan. What that means is, if you really study scripture, you will start to, you will start to see darkness and light apparent in the world and in people and words and actions and places and circumstances. You will start to see a clear divergence, a clear you know, separation between righteousness and corruption and evil, good and bad, falsehood and truth, it will start to become clear to you more and more. The more scripture you're reading, the more you're thinking about, the more you study it, the more you look at the prophetic teachings of guidance and, and character and, and belief, the more you find it very clear. So that you can be guided. Some scholars they said this is talking about the dividing of the sea. He gave you the, he gave him the book and then he divided the sea. Furqan. Could be. I mean if it's but once again, this is a person's opinion. So where does the guidance come from? With Atena in the royal we. We cannot rely upon people for guidance. 
So right now we have this thing. Muslims find themselves teaming up with the, uh, with the liberal community. We fit in because we're a minority. We have a lot of dark-skinned people in our community. And the Democratic Party, you know, tends to, you know, take care of that. They have this whole thing with the cake right now. You know what I'm talking about? The cake. The actual story is, some gay guys go in to buy a cake. And it's a wedding cake. The guy who owns the place said, I will not sell you a wedding cake. They said, why? He said, because I believe you're gay. Now, here's what's interesting. They did not say we're gay, number one. And they did not ask him, will you write uh, congratulation on your marriage, uh, Steve and Bill? He didn't, they didn't ask the guy, can you put two men holding hands and hugging on this? They just asked to buy a cake. So in this case, he's wrong. <laughs> They're just people who came to buy a cake. You don't judge people and say why. Now, but if they said, if I'm selling the cake and they said, I want you to put on this cake so I can buy it from you, congratulations to James and Bob on your marriage, I would say, I cannot do that. I cannot sell you something that is clearly in contrast with my religion. But many Muslims are saying, no, we should just do that for them. And we should buy the two men in the thing, embracing each other, and sell them. Many Muslims are saying like this. Particularly millennials in the MSAs across the country. This is their thinking process. We have to differentiate. We don't hate anybody, but to make money off of ithm, ta'awanu al al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu al al-ithm wa al-udwan. So uh, we don't. So that's where we draw the line. Somebody, if somebody came in, said, "I want to buy the cake." Okay, no problem. But whenever they say, "Here, make the cake in a way against your religion," for me, and that's where we draw the line. You see what I'm saying? Does that seem reasonable? And it would not be liberal for you to force me to get, make you a gay marriage cake. It would not be liberal. Liberalism says. Don't force your thinking and culture on people. That's called conservatism. Conservative is like, this is the standard that everyone should accept. That's called conservatism. That's what the meaning is. So these gay people are becoming quite conservative with their aggressive campaign to make what they're doing as normal and accepted by everybody. Isn't that ironic? Coming from the liberal party. And this is just where we understand concepts and then we can talk to people accordingly rather than just getting all emotional. You have many brothers in the Muslim community that would just hear the story and say, No, nah, I wouldn't sell the cake either. Hold on, bro. <laughs> They didn't do anything. Why is he telling that? Why is he deciding what they are and all of that? You know? So that's what Allah, inshallah. Any questions? Zakum Allah khairan. Subhanak Allah bihamdik. Shalom. La ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilaykum.